Um, thank you very much for the uh, invitation, Ronan and, and Prof. Um, what I'm going to try to do um, uh, in my talk now is give a, uh, a little bit of overview, overview about the Da Vinci robot, but because this is a, a very innovative, experimental sort of uh, summit, I want to then move on and talk about um, some of the work that we're doing in Leeds, plus some of the other work that's going on um, in other centres in the sort of uh, robotics, robotic platform field. So we've seen uh, this morning, this is um, the road we've come on over the last 20 years, from open surgery through laparoscopy, uh, onto notes with these uh, single site laparoscopy and various hybrid uh, interventions uh, in between. And really what we've been concentrating on um, is mainly been access trauma. How do we reduce access trauma and with that reduce pain, wound related complications and in turn enhance recovery, uh, quicker return to normal uh, activity and also cosmesis. There is another side to this and this is the trauma of the actual surgery itself and we've heard some techniques this afternoon about how we may be able to minimize our operations and actually influence the surgical trauma and maybe we'll hear a little bit more on that uh, tomorrow. Each of these techniques has its limitations as you're aware. So our laparoscopic techniques are technically challenging. They have long learning curves. The instruments we use are, are pretty primitive. So they're open and closed, they rotate, uh, they move around an axis, and we only have really four degrees freedom of, of movement. And it never ceases to amaze me what we can actually do laparoscopically with uh, just a pair of chopsticks. We have this inherent um, counterintuitiveness, this limitation of the, the fulcrum, the fact that you have a fulcrum, so you want to move to the right inside the body, you must move your hand to the left, and, th and that, um, that adds all to the technical difficulty. The other big drawback is our 2D visual field. We, we don't have um, the sense of depth, so if you want to go and pick up something, it's, it's often not until we hit that structure that we actually know where we are uh, in the operative field, and that, that makes us feel and look uh, really quite clumsy. There's a lack of tactile feedback, so you have no idea if you're grasping something whether you're really squeezing it or whether, whether you're touching it gently. And that predisposes to uh, tissue trauma. The whole thing is very unnatural for the surgeon. It's tiring, long operative times, and the whole ergonomic um, uh, environment is, is less than uh, ideal. In terms of sills, we've talked about these uh, problematic areas as well. So we have difficulty in that the optics and the working channels are all in the same direction. Uh, that gives us difficulty. Um, we have a reduced operative workspace, limited range of motion. We have increased distances because we're restricted. Where we put our, uh, our seal site, everything has to go from there to the operative field. Triangulation, which is key to retra retraction and accurate dissection, is difficult to achieve. We need to be able to do something useful inside there, so we've got to be able to anastomose and we've got to be able to deal with any complications hemostasis issues that may arise. Notes itself, even more um, problematic probably. Um, we have to have access to the peritoneal cavity, but not just getting into the peritoneal cavity, we need to close it effectively and safely. We've got to prevent infection, um, so actually causing harm by through, through the intervention. We've got to, again, do something constructive once we're in there and to not just constructive, but safely. So secure anastomotic and suturing devices we need. And we need to know how to manage any complications should they uh, arise. So I think the clinical needs that are common to, to whatever minimally invasive platform um, that, that we consider are, are listed here on, on the right side. This is not an exhaustive list, but what we do need are better physical uh, and visual access to our operative field. We need better and smarter instrumentation. We need enhanced information about the in intraoperative field, feedback from the field about what we're doing. And that may not just be visual, that may be other forms of sensing 
that can enhance and inform our, uh, our operative uh, experience. And whatever we do, we need to evaluate it properly and come up with uh, reliable training programs. So to my way of thinking, these are on the right-hand side are probably the enabling technologies that are going to help us uh, to meet these clinical needs. So we have the metatronics uh, that are going to give us the control systems and the ability um, to measure things and to do things more accurately. We need our, our sensors, our biosensors, our imaging systems to provide us with better information about the operative field. We need good surface engineering technology and material sciences to give us better interaction between the devices we design and the tissues um, that, that we use them on. So an understanding of the device tissue interface to minimize trauma, I think, um, is going to be important. And maybe we also need some sort of analysis of, hum of human movement and of laparoscopic or minimally invasive efficiency uh, and skills. Coming on to robotics, um, when we talk about robotics in surgery, it's not true ro uh, robotics. These are not robots as defined as a device that you can pre-program and you can let loose. It will perform that task repetitively, repetitively and uh, uh, exactly the same until you press the stop button. So the robots we're talking about are not really robots in surgery. They are master-slave devices. So they are controlled by a surgeon, a human, and they will only do what uh, that surgeon, that human, tells it to do. But accepting that the technology incorporated in that device may allow us to do it more accurately, with more dexterity, with more repeatability, and more reliably uh, than we could do if it was just a human and an instrument alone. The other advantage of robotic systems or these master-slave devices are that the computer software um, uh, embedded in them means that we can actually incorporate other technologies. So we can improve our optical interfaces um, and we can uh, design and control advanced instru instrumentation. So the current uh, uh, robotic system uh, I think everybody in the room will be familiar with the market is dominated at the moment by Da Vinci. It's the only com commercial robot. The advantages are the stable camera platform, the true intuitive ex uh, experience. So you look down a binocular microscope. You have a pseudo 3D image. It's not a real 3D image. It's a, it's a pseudo uh, image, but it does give depth uh, of field. And then we have these instruments with Enderist technology, seven degrees of uh, freedom uh, of, of, of motion, which adds to our, our operative uh, dexterity. And there's a variety of computer trickery, uh, which allows us to zoom in, zoom out, tremor elimination, image stabilization, etc. In terms of colorectal surgery, I apologize um, that uh, this is uh, a little bit on the dark side. It wasn't when I put it in, it just projects very darkly. I think most of us are agreed or coming to the, to, uh, the opinion that it is down in the pelvis, it is the rectal cancers uh, where the robotics is probably going to be uh, uh, mostly applicable. And it's the bit better visualization, the better optics, the 3D, the depth of field, the better retraction as well because we have two left hands as well as a right hand. So we, we can get a lot better retraction deep down in the pelvis. You're not reliant on anyone else. This is just, uh, this is just uh, the surgeon uh, being in control uh, of his operation. In this video, this is just our version of a transanal um, extraction. So we would do the standard TME down to the anorectal junction. Uh, we put a suture at a tie below the tumor. We digitally feel that we're below the tumor and we tie below the tumor. We have this right angled instrument that we do do a true right angle cut across the anorectal uh, junction. We extract it, we use an Alexis uh, wound retraction system through the anus to retract the specimen, amputate the specimen, put the anvil in, pop that back up into the abdominal cavity, and then um, the dexterity of the robot uh, in suturing it is appreciated deep down here. So you can reliably put a good first string suture around the distal uh, rectal stump. 
And when we've done that, we then tie that around uh, uh, the uh, head of the, uh, the spike of the gun inserted in the usual manner transanally, and then we just uh, complete our uh, anastomosis. So the robot, to my way of thinking, does enable us to do a transanal resection. It enables us probably to do a safer uh, rectal anastomosis um, because we do a double purse string and a single fired anastomosis. What's the evidence for robotics? Um, well, here are some of the papers up to 2009. It's a little bit old, this slide. You could add two or three other papers on the end of here. The most recent one I've seen is the South Korean paper, which describes their experience with just under 400 rectal cancers that they've done robotically and with uh, reasonably impressive uh, results. But again, the literature is confirming the general impression that it is rectal cancer um, that is emerging. Most of this is level four, level three stuff, one randomized controlled trial, but very small numbers, uh, 18 in each arm. But if we try and just take an overview uh, of what um, this uh, personal series sort of data shows us, well, so far the morbidity appears to be uh, comparable. The conversion rate may be a little bit lower robotically, um, and that's something uh, to consider. The operative times so far uh, have been longer. There are uh, learning curves associated with this, and I think they are probably embedded within um, this early literature. Oncological outcomes, uh, there's only a few studies which have actually uh, look, looked at the oncological outcomes, the short-term outcomes anyway, in terms of uh, resection margins, and they appear to be comparable. Length of stay also seems to be comparable. These are comparing robotic uh, with uh, laparoscopic on the whole. But the big issue, I guess, is, is the cost. Can we justify the cost? Because they are, uh, as an operation, uh, more expensive. So to try and work out um, whether or not we can actually, uh, th whether there is an advantage uh, to uh, robotic surgery or not, we've designed this trial. I'm pleased to say that Tim Rockwell and uh, Paolo Bianco in the audience uh, are supportive of this and we look forward to them uh, joining shortly. This is a trial of LAP versus uh, robotic surgery for rectal cancer. Because of the nature of it, it has to be an international study. It's funded by the Medical Research Council to the tune of 1.3 million, but that's a fairly modest sum for, uh, for an international trial. Um, and the participants, uh, UK, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, um, over to six or seven centers in um, the US, one in Brazil, Singapore, I've got two or three sites, and then um, South Korea, which are going to be a big player. So we've got about 20, 25 sites in total. And what we're going to look at, we're going to randomize one-to-one -one lap versus robotic for curative resections for rectal cancer. Our primary endpoints, one is a technical one, and that represents the, the feasibility, and it addresses the hypothesis does the robot make rectal cancer resection technically easier? If it does, then it should re result in a lower conversion rate. <coughs> As this is a cancer study, we need short-term oncological outcomes, and we're fortunate that we have Phil Quirk in Leeds to help us with this, so we're gonna have a look at the CRM positivity and local recurrence. Secondary endpoints, obviously, we're interested in those functional aspects, such as bladder and sexual uh, dysfunction. We're going to be interested in the health economics because people are going to be, want to know uh, whether we can uh, justify the robot. So there's no doubt that the technology incorporated it within the Da Vinci is a huge uh, advance um, uh, potentially for laparoscopic surgery. However, it does have its uh, limitations. It's still a big, heavy piece of uh, hardware. It's still very, very expensive, so 1.7 million um, or there or thereabouts for, uh, for a robot uh, today. It's still not great for tackling multi-quadrant surgery. It can be done, and the newer uh, SI versions of the machine certainly do address this uh, to some degree. It is still multi-port laparoscopy at the end of the day, so we still end up with four or five 
um, incisions. Whether that makes a difference, uh, I'm not sure. And people are still y using, uh, tending to use incisions for uh, specimen retrieval. But there are a number of uh, da Vinci intuitives on the horizon, uh, and some of these um, I've placed here. So there's an interest in, in maybe um, using the robotic uh, technology for tissue diagnosis, and tissue spectroscopy is, in, is being incorporated as one potential method for, for looking at and distinguishing disease from uh, non-diseased tissue. Da Vinci uh, intuitive are very keen to get their, the sizes of their instruments down, so they are developing the 8.5 millimeter HD cameras. Other developments are the application um, to single site surgery. So the robot with its crossed arms and the ability to switch um, at the user interface, your left and right arm, particularly lends itself to single site surgery. But the technical challenge has been uh, the making of the curved instruments, and that they seem to have achieved that. But these instruments, when they're curved, they lose their articulation. So as yet, they are non-articulated. And then the possibility of having these multifunctional instruments. So much like a, a hand where you'll have different fingers doing different things, one maybe with a laparoscope, one with some uh, uh, graspers, one with a cutting uh, agent. It's hoped that da Vinci will not have a stranglehold on, on the market for that much longer. And I think um, of all those systems coming through, this is probably um, the next to market. They seem to have got over some of the patent uh, problems um, uh, represented by uh, Intuitive. It's a German company, DLR, and it's, it's marketed as a, a, a Miro surge system. And its, its advantage really is that it's smaller, it's more compact. The individual arms you can actually um, clamp to the table. So there are less collisions. It's more suitable for multi-quadrant uh, application. But to my knowledge, um, uh, it, it's not actually uh, for, for sale at the moment. Other semi-robotic devices people will uh, be aware of are the freehand. I know that these are uh, in, uh, being used in the UK in probably four or five centers. So this is a, um, a camera system um, that um, there are some sensors that are used to pick up the surgeon's head movement. So if his head moves upwards into an upward gaze, the laparoscope moves downwards to give um, the representative uh, view. But what we also need uh, are some smarter instruments, I think. On the left here, these uh, are the typical instruments that we already have for notes. So we have the very flexible, the S-Bend uh, uh, endoscopes. We have various articulating instruments with different effectors on the end. But making an instrument articulate is, is just one part of the problem. And what, what we really need to do is think about uh, what laparoscopic surgery has done is it's taken the hand out of the abdomen and replaced it with, with fairly brutal instruments. So we need to get that hand back into the, uh, into the abdomen. And that's not just the articulation, it's the sensation, the palpation, the, the sensing that goes on in the hand. And if we look at the interaction of various um, instruments with tissues, all tissues do not behave the same. We have the same grasper that we use for every tissue in laparoscopic surgery. But a solid organ such as the liver, if you look at the stress strain uh, gauges for the liver, is completely different to the gallbladder or spleen. And maybe we need instruments that are actually uh, more compatible to the particular operations we're doing. And perhaps those instruments will have some sort of uh, actuated mechanism, some motorized mechanism whereby you grasp, it senses um, um, what tissue you're hold on, uh, holding, and it may be there's some sort of restricted um, uh, pressure that it will stop you um, from overexerting a pressure which will be uh, traumatic. So actuated uh, instruments, some sort of haptic feedback, I think uh, these are, are definitely the way the instrument technology is going to go. There is also the possibility that we can incorpor incorporate biosensors into these instruments. 
Now there's a lot of work in electronic engineering on a variety of biosensors, be that uh, to specific cancer biomarkers, or be it to markers of ischemia, or markers that, that, that or not markers, sensors that will distinguish blood vessels uh, from fatty tissue. All of these things are possible. The technology is there. It's just about miniaturizing things and putting them uh, into the right context. So talking about putting the surgeon's hand back into the operative field, um, this is a, a nice video, a concept that I think demonstrates this very well. So it, it's really about self-assembly instruments. It's maybe that we can't get the instruments in in one go and that we have to assemble instruments in the, uh, in the abdominal cavity. So it starts off with, with one um, part of the grasper going in, the other two are, are assembled once it's inside and then once it's assembled we have these three fingers, this thumb and two fingers um, that we are uh, potentially able to do something uh, useful with. <laughs> so you can imagine how you could miniaturize this down and uh, it, it would be most useful to us. Taking the concept even further, um, perhaps what we need are intracorporeal, intracorporeal robots. Um, so instead of having the big da Vinci on the outside, maybe we need to shrink it down and put maybe one or two or three or four mini robots actually into the abdomen. I guess one of the first groups um, to, to, to lead this field were uh, the, the group from ne Nebraska who came up with this sort of um, grooved rolling pin with a camera in it. Um, and this uh, is an umbilicated, a tethered device, so all the power, the optics is delivered to the tether. The tether also is a safety, so if you lose it, you can just, you can retrieve it again. And then this a uh, cylindrical device was supposed to roll over the intestine and provide uh, images back. I don't know whether they hit problems with this. I kind of think they did because the research papers sort of stalled about four or five years ago. There were some future papers from this group uh, of this uh, device on the right-hand side, and this is a static camera. So it's a camera that you would insert uh, into the abdomen, but you attach it to the abdominal wall, and then it's got a circular camera that can provide... Uh, laparoscopic images. So I, I just wonder whether they hit a, a problem with their a cylinder and, and decided to go more for a static camera. Other systems that, that have been published and, and, and put to test in, in animal models, this is the MAGS, the Magnetic Anchoring and Guidance System. This incorporates mag uh, the use of magnets, and I think magnetism is also an area that people are beginning to work on and explore because I think it does potentially offer us several solutions to the problems that we have in minimal in invasive surgery and notes. So the instrument is introduced through the, uh, through the gastroscope into the abdominal cavity. It's held to the anterior abdominal wall uh, by this console that also incorporates a magnet. So it's a magnet that holds it there. Um, it's then driven by the, by the, by the console and the, this is this by uh, manual um, device that allows you to do some sort of cutting, grasping, etc. So as a concept, it's, 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 um, it's trying um, to help us with uh, node surgery. Um, this is probably the biggest um, collaborative that I, I know about. It's the Arachnus Project. It's led by Alfred D uh, Corsieri from Dundee in close collaboration um, uh, with a research group in Pisa. There's a big robotics re research group in Pisa that um, uh, Alfred Cuscieri works with. It's a very bold statement that they've come out with. They want to integrate the advantages of traditional open surgery, laparoscopy, robotic surgery into a deeply innovative system for bimanual, ambulatory, tethered, visible, scarless surgery based on an array of smart microbiotic instruments. This, this will do everything for you. So it consists of a console. Uh, essentially, this is an endoluminal um, uh, program. So it, it's mainly about delivering minute instruments endoluminally um, via um, maybe the, the gastroscope um, to perform a variety of operations. Still, most of the des designs are, are umbilicated because there's the issue of power, control, and safety. So this is a, a mock-up of what it might look like, a console. 
the patient uh, on the operating table, there is a unit at the head which is, has the gastric uh, delivery system. There is also a unit through the umbilicus which is more of an intracorporeal than endoluminal system. And there are a variety of these uh, small uh, motorized um, devices. In Leeds, we've sort of, um, over the past five years, have been working along the same sort of concept. Our dream, if you like, is to take that uh, bit of the, ro uh, of the Da Vinci and to miniaturize it down into a, an intracorporeal device that we can therefore uh, deploy. The challenges, as we see it, minimization, well, you can make things smaller pretty easily nowadays. You can get little cameras off a mobile phone, you can get little actuators, so the miniaturization is not such a problem. Power supply, not such a problem if this is going to be tethered. The light source and imaging, you know, commercially available. The control systems are, are, are there. The big problem for us is adhesion and locomotion. How do you get a device to stick to the peritoneal cavity and to reversibly stick? So it's got to stick, but then release and re-stick if we're going to make this uh, move. So we've after much uh, uh, trial and error, we've tried various caterpillar devices um, and we've come down to the Cartesian walker. So this is a four-legged device. One leg moves forward, the second uh, leg moves forward and then it drags the hind legs behind it. So a very well characterized um, moving uh, platform for robotics. So this is uh, what we visualize our device to look like. It's a, essentially a four-legged platform. On each of the four legs will be an adhesive pad that we've got to stick to the peritoneum. And we, we can buy all these little actuators and, and we can make it move. Making it move is not the problem. But how do we solve the, the issue of adhesion? Well, one of my colleagues is heavily into biomimetics and that is copying nature or being bio-inspired, inspired by nature to solve our problems. And to look at the problem of adhesion, we've turned to nature and we've turned on the left-hand side to the gecko. And the gecko has a foot that has all these scepters on it and then all these nanofibrils. And you can stick a gecko to the ceiling when it's dead or alive. So it's not a living phenomenon that this thing can walk across the ceiling. It will stick when it's dead. It's purely physical. On the other hand, we can look at the South uh, African tree frog. And on its feet, um, which enables it to stick and walk very well, are loads of miniature, miniature uh, channels which drain off the fluid. Very reminiscent, really, of a car tire. So we've looked at a variety of patterns. We are fortunate in Leeds in that we have a, a, a nano manufacturing center where we can, we can make uh, a whole array of these uh, nano surfaces down here on the left-hand side. And we've tested a whole different array of them, different sizes, different patterns, different positions, uh, directly uh, on, on the undersurface of the abdominal cavity and at various uh, degrees of slope. And we have now a reasonable idea of what the best pattern is to give us adhesion. And what we're looking for is a microstructured surface rather than actually a, a nanostructured surface. So we need something that's actually quite rough uh, to get the best adhesion. So we've used these surfaces. We've gone um, actually to Covidian in, in Paris and we've tested them in the pig um, and we can get uh, weights to stick to the peritoneal cavity and to stick reasonably firmly. And I'll put that uh, picture in there of me just to show that I do actually sometimes do some of the work. So we've got some more work to do on that to, to get the adhesion better and to carry the payloads that we want. But we think there's promise there. The other area we're working on is this uh, multifunctional intracorporeal docking station. That's what we call it. Um, this uh, is a concept uh, mainly to help laparoscopic surgery. So it's a central access port from which an umbrella um, device comes out. And that may be insufflated with, 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 with an insufflator or, or it may be a mechanical mechanism. But the idea is that this will device will aid retraction, it will form a power supply, it will also be a docking station. So it may be that we can have two or three cameras attached to monorails on this system, and with two or three cameras we can stitch together the images and provide a 3D image for the laparoscopic surgeon. So it offers the advantages of helping retraction, 3D imaging, um, we could have one of the cameras, a fluorescent camera, the other a white light camera, and, and merge the images 
uh, as well. So we see this as just uh, a laparoscopic aid to try and, and help us in notes or uh, single incision surgery, etc. I will leave you this slide. This is from uh, uh, the group in Pisa. Uh, I put it future or fiction. Um, I'll leave it to you to make your mind up on it. Essentially, th uh, what they envisage um, is uh, a system of self-assembly devices. So somewhere in the future, they envision uh, the patient swallowing a capsule. When it hits the stomach, it dissolves, it releases um, all these uh, components that self-assemble into something like this, uh, which can grasp, cut, light, etc., do the operation, then disassemble, and then shoot off down through the pylorus and be eliminated. So in conclusion, robotic platforms, I, I think a revolution undoubtedly over the last 20 years have, have occurred from open laparoscopic robotic. I think it, the challenge now is for us to embrace the, the future, to look around, to engage our colleagues, and to apply the new technologies to solve our uh, current uh, uh, problems. I think master-slave devices or the use of robotics are, are here to stay, and I think they will be an integral part of future surgical practice. Thank you very much.